This is Town Square Sunday On Demand. And now, 1420 WBSM's Jim Phillips. Okay. Now for the first time in 2024, New Bedford Light columnist Jack Spillane joins us for a look at some of the top local stories in the new year. Good to see you, Jack. Happy belated New Year, Jim. Same to you. Thank you. I read your column about Herman Melville, and I thought it was very well done. Uh, it's incredible that no mayor before John Mitchell had come up with the idea for a statue in New Bedford honoring Melville. It's just incredible. Yeah, especially when you think that they built the statue to Nathaniel Hawthorne in 1925 yeah. in Salem. Now, Hawthorne had a good reputation. Melville, as we know, uh, was not popular when he died. And it was not until the centennial of his birth in 1919 that what's called the Melville Revival happened and people realized, oh, he was better than we thought. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but you've been a fan for a while, I guess. I have. I, I was an English literature major as an undergraduate and um, I read a lot of Melville. Um, and uh, always, like Moby Dick, I may be one of the few people who's read it in its entirety twice. Um but in college, uh, I um, learned about Billy Budd and some of the other stuff, uh, Clara the poem, and he's he's quite an accomplished guy. So you read Moby Dick twice in its entirety, <laughs> and I have friends. You scratched who are, your head more than once. I and, bet. Oh yeah, when you get to the whiteness of the whale chapters, oh, yeah. it's, it's yeah, a slog. That's, that's my favorite. I have to <laughs> read that chapter <laughs> when I asked to read and put on the list and all of that. So I had to read. The Whiteness of the Whale, or whatever his title was. and Yeah, that tired me out. Okay. Uh, I think a, Melville, um, my theory is that he, because Hawthorne told him to shorten it, and I think that Melville's theory was that much of a whaling voyage, this two, three years, is very boring, because it, it, most of the time you're not seeing any whales, and you're just floating around that great expanse of the ocean with nothing to do. And I don't know whether, you know, he started off to write travelogues, whether he got, you know, Melville was a, a, a writer, I think, that always liked a, a um, distraction, but still a great writer. So you attend the Moby Dick Marathon just about every year? I do, I do. I've read a couple times, but I mainly go just because I love it. And what I, makes I, it so special? You know, especially that Sunday morning, early morning, before the, it gets light, the dreary chapters are all over. They're getting to the part where the chase is. And there's a lot of philosophical stuff that, that's going on. The kids are in their sleeping bags who've just discovered Moby Dick. All these people who've loved it all their lives have come to read. Some of them murder it because it's, it's, it's 19th century language and it's hard to read. But something about it happening at night and with the lights and you know the whole um, spiritual aspect of Moby Dick is it's, it's wonderful. So, um, Melville belongs to many places, but uh, there may be uh, a number of reasons why we should erect a statue in New Bedford. He doesn't come from New Bedford, but he came to New Bedford. Yeah, he never lived here. Um, he came here to do research on the book, and he set sail from here, even though his original plan was to set sail from Nantucket, but New Bedford had overtaken Nantucket by that time. Mm -hmm. um, I think his sister lived here. One of his sisters, he had five, I think, lived here. Um, there's a Melville house where she lived, I think. But um, uh, but no, he never did. But there's still reasons to erect the statue in New Bedford. Oh, well, sure. He made the city famous. Uh, I mean, New Bedford has this great, I mean, New Bedford had a great mill era, but it's not world widely known for the mill era because lots of cities had great mill eras. New Bedford was the place during whaling, and then the great American novel was written about whaling, and New Bedford was called the dearest place in Moby Dick and all of New England. Oh, there's, there's plenty of reason. I mean, uh, authors tend to move around. Hawthorne grew up in Salem, but he never lived there as an mm -hmm. adult. You know, he's not buried there. So uh, we'll claim Melville. <laughs> okay. In uh, some other news, uh, Jack, uh, Andrew O'Leary, the New Bedford School District's fir former uh, finance chief, and the current interim superintendent has been named the permanent superintendent for New Bedford Public Schools. Much of a surprise there, huh? Yeah, a little bit of a surprise in that initially when he was named interim, Mayor Mitchell was talking about needing to do a search. 
But Andrew O'Leary is one popular guy. Uh, he's an Irish immigrant and uh, a very down-to-earth guy, a uh, very hard-working guy. And I think that there was just so much support for him in the city that there was no denying him this job, and, and I'm glad of it. All right. Um, and uh, certainly his finance background will come in handy. Uh, but in the article in New Bedford Light, they mentioned some of the test scores, and he's, he's got a big job ahead of him. Yeah, we've had a succession of superintendents who have not been able to turn around those test scores. And Mayor Mitchell, even in a recent in- interview, acknowledged what many have said for a long time. It's not realistic to expect New Bedford to compete with some of the, the more uh, wealthy suburbs when families are st- more stable up out there. And um, we have a large immigrant population, large non-English speaking natives. Um, we want to do as best as we can, but, you know, and there are people who can compete. People come from New Bedford High School and go to Harvard and Yale every year. That's right. But, but um, the expectation maybe uh, after 12 years in the job, Mayor Mitchell has come down to what other people have, have come down to. Mm-hmm. And that's interesting because when he started, when he first ran, he, was, he wanted to be the education mayor. Yeah, all sorts of superintendents have tried it. I would say the one who came closest was Pia Durkin, and she was the one who was least popular. The, the, the scores did go up a little bit, some schools that were closed. But she, she asked for and received the resignations of half the faculty. Very uh, stormy tenure. Finally did not have the support from the school committee to continue. Um, she was a general. But uh, I thought she was the right person at the right time, but not easy to live with. That's right. And uh, like Bill Belichick, yeah. when your time is up, time is up. Yeah, I think she may have been a little surprised when they, when they gave her the boot because she wasn't quite done. Yeah. Belichick is clearly done, but, but, yeah. but, well, maybe not in his mind, but <laughs> <laughs> in Bob Crafts. So. Yeah. You're listening to Town Square Sunday. I'm Jim Phillips. My guest is Jack Spillane, columnist for the online newspaper New Bedford Light. You can read Jack's work at newbedfordlight.org. Well, Mayor John Mitchell, beginning his sixth term in office, uh, congratulations uh, to the mayor. He was sworn in earlier this month. Uh, there was one big surprise during the inauguration ceremony. Governor Healy showed up to swear in the mayor. Uh, were you surprised to see her? I was, because usually we have Armin Fernandes swearing in the mayors, and I, I think in the 24 years I've been here, I have not seen a governor come. Uh, I'm told she went to Fall River the next day and swore in the Fall River mayor, and the lieutenant governor went to several different cities and swore smaller cities and swore in their mayors. Um, I came in for a little criticism on this one. You know, I, I congratulate the mayor for being elected to six terms. He's been a good mayor, but I felt his speech was flat, and I felt that the governor was um, not it was not good that she did not mention the crisis with the Star Store in, in her six minutes of remarks that she made before she swore him in. Well, um, the mayor gave scant mention to the closing of the UMass Dartmouth College of Visual Arts. Um, and Healy, uh, as you said, didn't mention it at all during her brief remarks. Uh, are they trying to forget about it upon Beacon Hill? Yeah, I think that they're hoping people will forget about it. Everybody, the mayor, uh, the governor, uh, the state senator, Mark Montigny, says that discussions continue to be ongoing with the UMass Building Authority and the Division of Capital Asset Management to come up with a plan to bring at least part of the College of Visual and Performing Arts back to New, New Bedford. It's been five months. I don't see it happening. I, I think that the strategy is to say that, you know, and to um, hope people will forget about it. The, the chancellor is the only one who is not talking about it. He's talking about building another, an addition onto the, the uh, CVPA building in Dartmouth. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, we've got a large building in downtown New Bedford with no tenants that I know of. Yeah. Are we just going to watch this thing fall apart? We already had a pipe burst um, this year. Uh, they fixed it. They said it didn't do too much damage. But my memory is of the Keystone Building that sat for 30 years empty, and then finally the roof collapsed. And, you know, the roof at, at the, the um, Star Store has some problems. I'm not saying it's at that point, but an empty building that size in downtown New Bedford, if you don't come up with a plan for it fairly quickly, 
seems to me to be trouble. I would agree. City Council has a new president. It's Councilor at Large Naomi Carney. Your thoughts about? Well, Councilor I was Carney. there when she was voted in, and I was struck by just the outpouring of goodwill for Councilor Carney, who is among the most conservative councilors on, on the council, someone who frequently votes against the mayor. But whatever you want to say about Naomi Carney, she's always pleasant. She always returns my phone calls and other people's phone calls who have written critical things. And I think that's different from what we've seen from some other counselors. And I was struck by it. Yeah. Um, well, that's, uh, I guess that's a good first step. Those of us in the media. Sure. Um, we'll give her time to get mad at us. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now the city council, as we mentioned, has a new president. There was also a hint of kumbaya in the inauguration. Um, during the ceremony at the, uh, was it Keith? Uh, Keith, Keith Carey. Okay, well, at Keith. Keith, Keith Mills, who well. Um, outgoing uh, President Linda Morad talked of putting aside personal differences and working together. Yeah, I, I thought Councilor Morad's speech was the best speech of the night um, during our inauguration night. It was totally unexpected by me. She even acknowledged that sometimes she has been intemperate in, in some of her remarks about people she's disagreed with. She talked about the New Bedford political scene reflecting the national political scene, and she called for, she said she would accept an olive all, all branch from anybody in, made in good faith. And um, the mayor almost came to similar remarks, so I, I thought it was a, a very good gesture. Well, uh, all right, um, and that's fine. And after the council session where the new president was elected, I guess Morad came up to you and said something? So myself and Arthur Hirsch, who were in the council chambers uh, to uh, see you know, the vote for the new president, and she kept it, she said, I just want you to know that I'm going to be returning phone calls, but she has not been to either me or, or Arthur. I, I understand for me, I've, I've made critical, I've wrote, wrote, written lots of critical things about her, but Arthur is just trying to cover it, and, and I thought that you shouldn't you know, blame the reporters for what the columnist writes, but it was a good gesture on her part. We both appreciated. Um, are there any uh, major issues facing the council as we head to the new into the the new year here? Well, I think the first one is going to be residency. You know, I think I think that there is uh, support for getting rid of the residency completely. Although I don't think people will accept it for um, police or teachers because I'm, I'm not sure how it applies to teachers actually, but certainly for police because I think people want those police to be part of the city early on. But other than that, you may have some disagreement on the council, the residency re requirement the mayor wants to get rid of. He also said he wants a, a stronger penalties for um, absentee landlords. We've heard that before. Um, we'll see. I, I think uh, rent control is going to be back, but I talked to Councilor Burgo, and he says he does not believe that there are the votes to put it on the ballot again. Hmm. Isn't that funny? Yeah. There were votes. Now there's no, no well, votes. Well, it seemed like it was a deal last time. I'll give you this if you give me that. They said it wasn't a deal. Looked like a deal to me. Um, but now there's no deal. <laughs> <laughs> and, the, and the other new faces on the council that are really not new faces? Yeah. Councilor Joe Lopes coming back. And um, Leo um, Choquette, who has been yeah, active on the zoning board and yeah. active around town, finally succeeded after four tries to get elected to the council. I think that's a, a lesson. It's not a not a Brian Gomes lesson. Not quite that many times, but you know, you try four times. Hopefully, sometimes. Yeah, I think people do get discouraged sometimes. Good people, and it takes a while for the voters to get to know you. That's it. That's it exactly. Wonders will never cease in New Bedford politics. That's... Nope, we're having fun doing it, covering it though. <laughs> All right, uh, as we head to the new year, the uh, New Bedford light uh, still going strong. Still going strong. Uh, we had a good year last year. Uh, we are solvent. We're heading into our fourth year. Um, we tell the stories behind the stories, the stories that you may have not been able to read uh, in other media these days. Uh, so um, we're dedicated to it, and we intend to keep going. All right. My guest has been uh, my good friend, Jack Spillane, who is from the online newspaper, uh, New Bedford Light. You can read Jack's work at New Bedford Light dot org and uh, you can check out uh, not only jack's work but many more interesting articles and stories 
at newbedfordlight.org. Jack, thanks for coming in. And you are my longtime and good friend also, so okay. thanks for having me. Okay, that's, uh, that's good, uh, because uh, I'd hate to add to your enemies list. You know what I mean? I that. <laughs> me too. <laughs> <laughs> There's more to come on Town Square Sunday. Stay with us. <laughs> 